Well, as you know, we've been going through the book of James, but we're going to take a hiatus today and go to Jeremiah and Psalms to uh, maybe speak a little bit to the men, but the message that also all of us can, can hear and, uh, and is something we need to hear. Jeremiah 5.1 Roam to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and look now and take note, and seek in her open squares if you can find a man. There is one who does justice, who seeks truth. Then I will pardon her, pardon Jerusalem. Then in Psalm chapter 1, beginning verse 1, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so but they're like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, the way of the wicked will perish. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your words. Lord, it's somewhat easy to see how these apply in the day in which they were written, but today it's often difficult for people to see the truth, for that truth to set them free from the sin that now binds them. So help us, Lord. Break the word small so that we can understand and teach us. Father, show us your love, your mercy, but Father, also show us the wrath that is to come so that we might escape it, turn to you. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, every home needs a strong symbol of authority when the Father is willing to accept this challenge and at the same time be compassionate and tender in dealing with every member of the family. The home has a solid human anchor. It's so important. But the father actually cannot be all he ought to be as a father and as a man unless he knows Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. This message this morning is really twofold. First, it's an appeal for all men to be godly. Second, it's an urgent plea for every father to be in Christ the head of the home and the family. Every father needs to be that spiritual leader. What we need today is men of conviction. We need men of conviction. As we, as we look at our world, we see der deterioration on every hand. We see that so many people today who once had deep convictions concerning right and wrong have yielded to compromise, to sacrifice principles. Years ago, an ancient philosopher by the name of Diogenes was walking throughout the streets of his city with a lantern. Someone asked him what he was doing. He replied, I'm looking for an honest man. The story of Diogenes and his lamp is, is probably one of the best known antics of the ancient philosophers. He was a cynic, a philosopher who lived in ancient Athens. Salvador Rosa, a 17th century Italian painter, depicted this scene in the painting before you. Diogenes in search of an honest man. We see this aged cynic with a, a light lamp that's lighted in the middle of the day, surrounded by sneering and laughing people. But alas, they're just commonplace people, just idiots really. They lack virtue, they lack true reason, they're not honest, they don't represent the true humanity that Diogenes was 
sincerely looking for, earnestly trying to find. In our passage that we began with this morning, Jeremiah lived really in the exact same circumstances as Diogenes. God told the prophet, go up and down the streets of Jerusalem, look around and consider, search through her squares. If you can find but one person who deals honestly and speaks the truth, I will forgive this city. Today, God is looking for those who will stand for righteousness in our society, for people who will take their stand for his word and his ways, the, the challenge that each of us faces as the light of His Word shines upon us is, will I be an honest and true human being? Or will I be shown to be a scoundrel? The word they used to use is rogue. The situation in Jeremiah's day was similar with Diogenes, and the situation in our day remains the same. God was urging His people to run throughout the streets the city and see if they could find anyone who practiced justice, anyone who sought the truth. Not their truth, but the real truth, God's truth. Today we have a confusion on what real truth is. We think we can have our own and fool ourselves. Jeremiah's conclusion was that God would spare the entire city if only one such individual could be found. I think Abraham, when he bargained with God about the city of of Sodom, very similar circumstances, he, he says to the Lord, Abraham, as he's dealing for Sodom, Lord, will you destroy Sodom if 50 righteous men can be found, he asked him. No, the Lord answered Fifty no. How about forty? I won't destroy it for forty righteous men, the Lord answered. Lord, what about thirty? Abraham was trying his his Lord, it seems. And God responds, I won't destroy it for thirty. Twenty, Lord? I won't destroy it for twenty. If there are ten righteous men in Sodom, will you destroy it? No. We don't know why, but Abraham left the bargaining table at that point, no doubt feeling as though certainly there were ten righteous men in the entire city. Surely he could find ten. But the Bible says there are none righteous, no, not one, that all have sinned. All of us have come short of the glory of God in Romans chapter 3. Obviously, Sodom was no exception. But is Springfield, Missouri an exception? Christian people in our country today have become discouraged because they've looked to leaders and have been very disappointed. Instead of integrity, integrity, we've seen dishonesty among those that we respect and hold in highest regard. Instead of purity, we've seen immorality. Instead of righteousness, we've seen sinfulness. We need today people with character who won't be swayed by the desire for gain or glory. In our homes, we need fathers who have convictions concerning their faith in Jesus Christ, concerning their marriage vows, and who who are willing to practice these virtues in daily life, just everyday life. When our homes have these kinds of husbands and fathers, families will grow up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord because the Father will be in church, leading his family in spiritual things. Secondly, we need men of compassion. I'm sure we all remember this story in Matthew 9, beginning at verse 9. It says, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth, and he said to him, follow me. He got up and followed him. 
Then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy and need, who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. There are none righteous, but, but the Lord says, I am coming particularly to those who recognize their need to the publicans, the prostitutes, the sinners, the street people. I wonder if we as the church today are like that. I wonder if the church which should be representing Jesus is now just comfortable with religious people, but is turning off the sinners and the street people and the common folks. Jesus said here, I don't want sacrifice. I, I want mercy, compassion, concern for everyone. In other words, I don't want some unfeeling religious ritual, something you you do because you're in church or trying to show how holy you are. I want to see the tears in your eyes because you really care to serve people, to teach them how to, how to be saved, how to find forgiveness for their sins. I hope unbelievers relate to you as well as your brothers and sisters in the Lord do. I hope they don't look at you as being holier than thou. I hope people enjoy your company because you represent life and joy. And that there's this quality about you that attracts people, believers and sinners alike. Because you're just somebody who loves the Lord and loves anybody else. That was certainly true of Jesus. And that was true of Matthew as he said to his friends after leaving the tax collecting behind him. Come on over to my house. Meet the one who has shown such grace and mercy to me. We need more Matthew parties where people open their hearts and their homes saying, I want you to be exposed to the one who's changed me. I want to share Jesus with you. His love. Compassion. To be strong and uncompromising isn't enough, however, to make an ideal man or father. We need men who are tender, men who are compassionate. Far too often a man thinks he has to put on a strong front or people will think him effeminate. Actually, the opposite is true. It takes strength of character to be kind and unselfish. Jesus was the manliest person who ever lived, and yet he also knew how to enter into the sorrows of others and share their griefs. To sympathize and empathize. Edward Young once said, Shun the proud that is ashamed to weep. Edmund Burke said that next to love, sympathy is the divinest passion of the human heart. When we're able to feel with people, we develop a tender heart and a compassionate disposition, and that's perhaps the manliest of all qualities. One outstanding preacher once said, How long, oh, how long will it take us to learn that there are only two things in life? that really count. One is character, and the other is human sympathy. Next, we need men who are willing to learn. Listen to Ephesians 5, 7 through 10. The Apostle Paul wrote, Therefore do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are a light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. He used to walk in darkness, but now you're proving or literally learning what is really acceptable in God's sight. 
Paul is telling us. In other words, if, if I sit in the theater and watch people indulging their fleshly lusts, or on the, on the TV or the movie screen, I, I'm a partaker in that activity. I support it financially when I buy a ticket or when I buy the DVD of such a movie. I vote, I vote for our culture to keep making that kind of movie whenever I fill a seat to watch it or purchase it. There's a better way. We, we can pray. You know, I struggle with my flesh, Lord. You know, I'm, I'm tempted by it, but Lord, I want nothing to do with it. I've learned through your word and by experience that sin stinks. Sin destroys. I feel ruined. I've learned through your word and by experience. I'm not going to justify that any longer. I'm not going to excuse it anymore. Instead, I choose to walk in light. That's what Paul is encouraging us to do. Having described the lifestyles of those who walk in darkness in, in the previous verses, beginning here in Ephesians 5, 7, Paul urges his reader, readers to not be partakers with them. Don't join in. The implication is that true believers can, at least for a season, get caught up in some of the worldly practices that were just described. Why would, would those who've been made partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel in chapter 3, verse 6, ever want to lock arms with those whose end is destruction? The sons of disobedience, he calls them in 5, 6. Wander all their days in a cavern of sin and its, its treacherous darkness. Where danger might be one step away. Why would we want to follow their blind lead when we've been called out of darkness into the marvelous light of Jesus Christ? I, I don't know if, if you've noticed here in verse 8 that Paul doesn't merely say that believers in Christ once lived in darkness. His language is so much stronger than that. In, in our life before Christ as unbelievers, he actually says that we were formerly darkness. You see the difference? Living in darkness might allow for the possibility that we have at least a pilot light or a faint glow allowing us to get by with a few good words. But when, when Christ, when, when Paul is telling us here that really we, we are darkness, we were darkness itself. He means that we were actually part of the problem. We don't even have a spark of divine life. What a, what a hopeless condition we're in when we're living in sin. Apart from divine grace, we were stumbling around in the darkness, trapped in the dungeon of our sin, unable to find the way out. We were shallow. We were superficial. We were selfish. Both in secret and in public, we did things we're ashamed of today, but we had no power to change. No matter how many New Year's resolutions we vowed, it didn't take any of, us, any of us but just a few hours, maybe even a few seconds before we broke that resolution we had just declared. We didn't change. We couldn't change. We were powerless. We were helpless. Hopeless. We were lost in our sin. But then Christ came, pierced the darkness of our souls. Remember that line in Charles Wesley's moving him, and can it be? Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast found in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. Formerly darkness, now light. That's the new identity for all believers in Christ. From the moment they place their faith in Him, we become light, children of light. As light bearers who reflect God's perfect light of holiness, 
and truth and love and hope. We're, we're urged to point the way for others to escape the darkness, to show them the way. To do this, we need to walk as children of light, he says here in chapter 5, verse 8. Walk as children of light. What does that look like? Paul describes it as producing goodness, righteousness, and truth. We depart from the former ways described in verses 3 through 5, and instead, pleasing the Lord becomes our life's ambition. Lord, whatever you want, not what I want. I'm not going to keep demanding my way. Paul describes here a complete reorient, reorienting. You know, we had a different orientation before, and now because Christ is, is in our lives, we're, we're reorienting. A turning away from the path of darkness and advancing on the path of light and life. And all, all set in motion and empowered by the grace of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. There's where the power comes from. Anybody ever taken a cave tour? Been in a cave? I know some people who go spelunking. I've never actually explored a cave that way. That seems a little bit beyond my uh, security level. But I have gone on a bunch of cave tours where there are guides who show you the way through the cave. And often during these, these tours, once you reach the heart of the cavern, you're way down in the depths of, of the earth. It's usually cold and damp and dark off in the distance, even with a few incandescent bulbs glowing here and there on the path. And then all of a sudden, the guide does something the group isn't expecting. You hear this click. And they turned off the lights. Ever experienced that? If you've ever had that experience at the moment when the lights go out, you know what people mean when they talk about thick darkness. You can't see anybody around you. You might hear them, but you can't see them. And if you put your hand right in front of your face, you can't even see the movement. You, you might feel the heat of your, your hand. It's the kind of darkness that would cause grown men to revert back to childhood phobias. Then all of a sudden, without warning, the, the tour guide might light a, a tiny match. Gentle snap and the light comes on and in that pitch blackness it only takes that small spark of the fire to illuminate the whole area where you're standing. Instantly you can see the faces in the group now. Rather dimly, but you can see them. Like me, they'd all been looking around, walking into the darkness, desperate to, for something to catch their gaze. And when the matches light pierced the darkness, and then every face did instantly turned toward that match, like members of an orchestra, fixing their attention on the conductor. One little light, it not only drove out the darkness, it also attracted attention. We couldn't help but stare at it, be referenced to it. Travel back with me just a, a little over 2,000 years ago, not to a cavern, but to a hillside, not in a place of physical darkness, but to a land of spiritual darkness. Sitting on the, that hillside was a revolutionary teacher who was just getting underway in his what would be a relatively short three-year ministry. The religious officials who were supposed to be reflecting God's light were instead snuffing it out wherever they found it. They sneered and frowned and murmured among themselves. The teacher sat on that hill and calmly preached a sermon that would be never be forgotten. Perhaps the most significant message ever preached. Sermon on the Mount, we call it. 
In that immortal message, Jesus spoke these very unforgettable words to his followers. Matthew 5, verse 14, you, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. What good advice to fathers. What good advice to every one of us. If you can learn an important lesson about light in a dark cave, not about the brilliance of a flickering match, but about you know, this little light of mine, and I'm going to let shine. Christ commands us to shine before all people. That light will not only drive out the darkness of this wicked world, but it will also attract attention and, and turn hearts and minds toward the Lord our God. We need men who are willing to learn what, it, what is pleasing to the Lord. Finally, we need men who love their families. Listen now to Luke 11, beginning at verse 11. Jesus says, Now suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he is asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Jesus there used these words as a kind of far-fetched illustration in order to make his point. You know, no human father of any worth would listen to his son asking for something to eat and reach down into a snake pit, you know, give some kind of dangerous, poisonous animal to his child. But, the father meets the child's need rather than scaring him or harming, harming them in some way. In the same way, a request for an egg isn't met with the gift of a stinging scorpion compared to God. We all stand as evil sinners. We, we can't compare our love and goodness to God. Still, we know, we know how to give good gifts, you know, to give what our children need. We can be good to them. Family is, is probably the most profound of all human relationships. A, a man who genuinely cares for his family is investing his affection in that which will pay the greatest dividend of all. Many changes have taken place in family structure during these past days. More and more fathers are having a part in duties that once were considered altogether the woman's responsibility and vice versa. When men can help their wives in such areas, he, he just kind of adds icing to the cake in their marriage relationship. And this, however, isn't the basic idea involved in loving your family. Most, most important, I think, if a man loves his family, he'll be faithful and true to the marriage vows. We can never be certain as to how accurate the polls are concerning marital infidelity in the nation. We do know, however, that an increasing number of men are unfaithful to their wives or those that they've committed to in some way. Unfaithfulness also affects their children in a very striking way. Often we hear men urge to love their children, and of course that's extremely important. But more important for men who want to show genuine love for their children is to love their children's mother. Because children, to know that daddy loves mommy, it is true to her in every relationship in, of life, that it just, the statistics prove it, it produces stabler mental, emotional health uh, than for the child to have daddy pour out love in the form of extra gifts, but have no relationship with mom. 
all of the fishing trips and ball games just will not suffice to bring love to a child if that father has been unfaithful to the child's mother. And I suppose we'll never be able to measure accurately this emotional instability present in children because of parental bickering and fighting. Many children have been deeply scarred because of it, and there's evidence of it all over. We need men today who love their families by showing loyalty in every way to the women they've chosen as their companions. Dr. Charlie Shedd held a contest that he called One Neat Dad. He asked contestants to send in letters recommending their dad for this great honor, and here are a list of the, the 10 most appreciated qualities for One Neat Dad. The people who responded said, he takes time for me. He listens to me. He plays with me. He invites me to go places with him. He lets me help him. Mm. I don't know how big they are. That could be challenging. He treats my mother well. He lets me say what I think. He is nice to my friends. He only punishes me when I deserve it. He is not afraid to admit when he is wrong. Qualities one through five are versions of the single word time, T-I-M-E. You might also spell it listen, spell it play, spell it help me. It all comes out the same. Time was the most appreciated trait of one neat day. God wants people who are willing to be responsible. Some people are, are made in God's, you know, all people are made in God's image because they are. They have the power to do what God requires of them to do. God didn't create people to be robots, but rather free moral agents, people who can choose righteousness on their own. The capacity to choose makes people accountable for their choices. And God is the judge of our use or misuse of the talents that he's given to each one of us. Glorifying God involves total commitment to God. Total commitment to him. This, this means, the Bible puts it, dying to self. To our own ambitions, our own cleverness. Such people must say with Paul, Lord, what will you have me do today? Knowing that God can be depended on to take care of our necessities, we must rest in this confidence and serve with steadfastness His will, not our. In this world of uncertainty, turbulence, you name it, we can radiate peace and confidence if God lives in our hearts through Jesus Christ. Such people will obey God at all costs. Realizing that they can do nothing in their own strength. We need people today who will walk with God continually and will consistently seek to know His will and then do it with all their might. Everything they have. Sunday school class of first graders was asked to draw a picture of God. The pastor stopped by to inspect their work. The children were happy to show their drawings, as all kids are. Doesn't matter what they're drawing. One had depicted God in the form of a brightly colored rainbow. Another had drawn the face of an old man coming out of billowing clouds. There was one rendition that looked a whole lot like Superman. Perhaps the best was the one proudly displayed by a boy who said, I didn't know what God looked like, so I just drew a picture of my daddy. That first creator showed a lot of wisdom. 
Because he's right, nobody knows what God looks like because nobody has seen him, but God has revealed himself as a father to those who are related to him by faith. I'll leave you with this this morning, Hebrews 12, verses 9 and 10 from the Contemporary English Version. It reads, Our earthly fathers correct us, and we still respect them. Isn't it even better to be given true life by letting our spiritual father correct us? Our human fathers correct us for a short time, and they do it as they think best. But God directs us for our own good because he wants us to be holy as he is. We're going to stand and sing a final song. Rise up, O men of God. Be done with lesser things. If you need to make a decision for God and come to faith in him today, the altar will be open for you to come. But let's all of us commit to be the kind of people that God wants us to be, to submit to his will as fully as we possibly can. And especially you fathers, may God bless you and help you and encourage you to be the best dad that you possibly can. Let's all stand and commit to the Lord as we sing.